These are the sort of stories that you just simply hate to see, especially if it is involving someone in the ministry. Whether you agree with this person's doctrinal stance or not, you don't want to see or ever hear someone who is naming the name of Christ, especially in leadership. You don't want to hear these sort of allegations, no matter how old they are. This comes about because of something that just popped up about something that happened 35 years ago with a well-known megachurch pastor that is Robert Morris. His church is, if not the largest, one of the largest churches in America. Uh, it's here in, in the DFW area in South Lake. It's Gateway Church. Beautiful campus, large church, uh, a large reach, a lot of influence. And the question is, and this is an issue for them, but also for us, because we, we don't want to just look at a story, just look at it for the sake of just seeing it. We want to also apply it to us and how we ought to do things and then see what the Bible says and what's the biblical way of approaching something. So here we've got these allegations, uh, not even allegations, I should say, but something that happened 35 years ago. Now, what was stated, what's being told is something vile. There are a couple of things that I, I cannot, I, I just abhor. One, any person, especially a male, hurting a female. I cannot say that. Secondly, when it's a, someone hurting a child. But then when you combine the two, a male, a grown man hurting a child, a female child, not that, not that it's, it's less when it's a male child, um, anything sexual regarding a child, that is just abhorrent. Uh, I do not like that. I can't stand that. As a matter of fact, that's one of the things uh, that just is just aggravating. Even people in prison cannot stand that. So you think the people who have who uh, have respected or disrespected the laws of society, even they understand that's some that's a line we don't cross. And this particular pastor did so. The problem is it was 35 years ago. Now, the Bible tells us this, and I want to I want to be careful with how, with how we say this, but I want to be as godly and as biblical as possible. The Bible says, brother, if anyone is over or caught in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in spirit of gentleness, each one looking to yourself so that you too will not come to be tempted. Now, when it talks about restoration, that means you restore someone to the actual position they were taken down from sometimes. But not always. Restoration doesn't necessarily mean that you go to the exact position because that may not be appropriate. That may, not, that may be harmful for the ministry. The question is, here we have this incident that happened 35 years ago. What do we do about it? So what I want to do is I want to just kind of read a little bit about what happened. Uh, now, this happened in, I think it's 82 uh, with, a, with a young lady. She's older than me now. She's 54 now. She was 12 years old. And I uh, according to this, this understanding that Robert Morris, who was married at the time in his early 20s, I thought it was actually 20, but it's his early 20s, um, was staying with the person's family or, or around this young lady. And this was happening over the course of some time where he was kissing, but not just kissing. There was more to it as well. Uh, they referred to it as inappropriate sexual behavior. Well, uh, there's a little bit more than inappropriate sexual behavior. Apparently, there was some sort of, as I'm, I'm trying to look look on this article, because I want to read what, what she says as well. Now, obviously, when you revisit a sin, typically the natural thing is to kind of sanitize it. And no one gives details because sometimes you just don't, you don't go in through, into depth. Uh, but sometimes some of the details, or at least the allegations, are are necessary. And so when they say this was uh, inappropriate touching and kissing and so forth, and, but the problem is it happened over a course of years, which makes you wonder, wait a second, this is a this was an ongoing thing. How many times it happened? Don't know. But her statement, how she puts this is that it wasn't just inappropriate touching. This was uh, inappropriate touching uh, to rape by instrumentation. In other words, that he used something. And I don't want to get too, too, too vivid because I don't think, no, that Maybe we do need to, but we won't hear. So uh, there's more to it. Uh, and he was, again, married at the time, staying with them. And the understanding of what's been given is that uh, there was some sort of restoration process that happens. Matter of fact, let me just read a statement from the elders of Gateway Church because they are out. Obviously, they're going to have to do some sort of uh, damage control. But in this, it says that uh, Pastor Robert has been open and forthright about a moral failure. Uh, that he had over 35 years ago while he was in his 20s and prior to him starting Gateway Church. He has shared publicly from the pulpit uh, the proper biblical steps he took in his lengthy restoration process. The two-year restoration process was closely administered by the elders at Shady Grove and included him stepping away or stepping out of the ministry during that period while receiving professional counseling 
and freedom ministry counseling. Since the restoration or since the resolution of this 35 year old matter, there have been no other moral failures. Pastor Robert has walked in purity and has placed accountability measures and people in his life. The matter has been properly disclosed to church membership or leadership. Uh, Robert Moore stated, when I was in my early 20s, I was involved in inappropriate sexual behavior with a young lady in a home where I was staying. It was kissing and petting and not intercourse, but it was wrong. The behavior happens on several occasions over the next few years. In March 1987, the situation was brought to light and it was confessed and repented of. I submitted myself to the elders, a shady girl of the church, and the young lady's father. They asked me to step out of the ministry and receive counseling and freedom ministry which I did since that time. I have walked in purity uh, and, and accountability in this area. Two years later, in March 1989, I stepped back into ministry with the full blessing of the elders and her father. Uh, in October 1989, Debbie and I met with her and her family, and I asked their forgiveness, and they graciously forgave me. This sin was dealt with correctly by, by confession and repentance, which I did in 1987. Now, the, there's only one problem with that. I can't say speak to the validity of it, nor can you. The only ones that can would be uh, Robert Morris and his family, as well as a young lady. Now, she says that her father did not bless them, uh, that he forgave them, but that was that. And she's still bothered by it. Apparently, she's still bothered by it. Now, I don't know what to make of that. I won't try to make anything of that. I'm not going to be the one that says, well, she's just uh, bringing this up now, uh, or she has a legitimate concern. That's not the issue, at least not right now. I don't know all the steps that were taken now. At that point in time, what was the right thing to do was to sit him down. Now, could he ever come back to ministry? And that is the issue that we have to deal with. And I want to be consistent. I want to be consistent, uh, whether it's someone that we like, someone that we don't like. Now, I have never uh, thought that, well, I shouldn't say never, but I don't think very highly of Robert Morris, uh, his doctrine, his issues with the Trinity, his issue with, with uh, spiritual gifts and tongues and tithing and so forth. Be that as it may, though, uh, thus far, we can say this, that from that time that we know of and all that we know, he has walked in a way that we don't, we don't know of any other moral failings. We don't know of any other particular sin in his life. This one, though, however, is egregious. But what do we do about the most egregious of sins if they were repented of? And in this case, 35 years ago, many of the folks are going to watch this video weren't even alive at the time or barely walking or talking. So what do we do about this? 35 years ago, to what degree do we hold this over a person's head? Or is it one of those cases where I've stated before, sometimes you're forgiven, but the consequences might linger. Now, I want to caution us on two fronts. One, for in regards to him, but then also in regards to us. Well, I'll deal with us in just a little bit, but let's go to the to what the Bible speaks about the qualifications of an elder, because I think this is where we should be led by. Uh, an overseer must then be above reproach. I'll come back to that, and I'll say this before, that the word that's used here, the Greek word that's used here for all this is uh, ani. This is a present tense. This is what it, what it means to be right now. Now, I've said this before. A person that's qualified for a pastor today doesn't necessarily mean that they're qualified in the future or they were qualified in the past does not mean they're qualified today. It is present tense. So you have to be at the moment that you're a pastor. You have to meet these qualifications. And so as an overseer, you must be above reproach. The husband of one wife, temperate, prudent, respectable, hospitable, able to teach all of these things that matter if you will be those things or if you were, it's right now. And there's a reason why I'm saying that uh, not addicted to wine or pugnacious, but gentle, peaceable, free from the love of money. He must he must be one who manages his own household. Well, or else how will he manage the household of God? But then it's part right here in verse seven. And he must have a good reputation with those outside the church so that he will not fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. Now, when I said that this to be this, I name means it's a present tense. Well, a couple of things to be above reproach comes into play and to have a good reputation amongst the outsiders. What if though this was something that he repented of? And let's let's just say, because I believe this, and we all have to believe this, that no matter what the sin was, no matter what it is, how egregious, how nasty, how vile it was, God can overcome those things. You can be changed, you can be fixed with that. And do I believe that a person who has ever done anything with a child can be healed, can be fixed from that? Sure, otherwise we are limiting the power of God. Can God do that? The question is, is there any resulting stain that comes from that, anything that might put the ministry in a negative light. I've said this before, and I've used a, a, kind of a goofy example, 
but one that kind of makes a point. If a person has committed a sin and they pay for their sins and they are 1000 percent changed from that. The problem is going to be, though, how will people that you will minister to look at you? In other words, if the sin that you committed, uh, you pass that. But if the people can't get past that, if when they see you, they see that sin. Now we've got a problem. Now there'll always be someone that's going to bring your sin back, back to, uh, to the to the forefront, to the limelight. There's always going to be that person, namely Satan. But by and large, especially the people that you are ministering to. And so I use an example, let's say, of someone like a Jeffrey Dahmer. If Jeffrey Dahmer were to actually, now he's, he's dead, but if he were alive or someone like that, some mass murderer, some serial killer, some person who has done something even as heinous as Jeffrey Dahmer was saved, uh, 20, 30 years later, goes into the ministry. It would be hard for the people in that church or anyone else to look at him and not think about, hey, that's the guy that was doing this and doing that. And that's some of the that's kind of the guidance that this is saying. That's why it's a present tense. So above reproach doesn't necessarily mean that you're in sin, but it's how people look. Or is there anything that they are looking at you or holding over your head, your reputation amongst the outsiders, as well as the insiders, those inside the church? That absolutely matters. Why? Because it can be a stain on the name of the Lord on the church. Let me give you an example. In Samuel, two examples in Samuel, as a matter of fact, at the very beginning of Samuel, uh, Eli, who was ra helping to raise or kind of mentor Eli, had two, had two sons, Hophni and Phinehas. And now the Lord is angry with them because they were doing things that were just ungodly. And I want you to notice what he states here in First Samuel, excuse me, uh, chapter 2, verse 17. He says, thus the sin of the young men was very great before the Lord. For the men, that is the people there, the men there despised the offering of the Lord. In other words, what they were doing made it a problem for the people. The people began, instead of looking down at uh, those two men, they began to associate that with the name of the Lord and the offering of the Lord. That is a huge problem. And then we go to 1 Samuel chapter 8, and then I want you to notice what they said about Samuel's boys. So now let's go to 1 Samuel chapter 8, verse 4. Now this is Samuel, who's a godly man, obviously, but his sons were not. He says, Behold, the people say to him, Behold, you have grown old and your sons do not walk in your ways. Now appoint a king for us to judge us like all the nations. But the thing was displeasing in the sight of Samuel. But now notice what, what the Lord says. The Lord says, Listen to the people in regard to all they say, for they have not rejected you, but they have rejected me from being king over them. And so when the sin of the people who are representing God uh, becomes comes to the forefront, it can become a hindrance and they in turn start rejecting God or they start looking at God in a negative way. Not because of what God has done, but because of what the people have done. So in this case that we have with Robert Morris, it's 35 years ago. He says that he's gone through everything. He's been accountable. Now, I don't know if he's been totally forthright and upfront with everything. I don't know. I can't speak to that. The, the, the lady now seems to say, no, not totally. And you're making it as though that we gave our blessing for him to go back into ministry. Not that they ever would or actually even need to. Uh, I think it's best, though, if they do. The question is now, should he have ever been put back in, in ministry? Now, legally, there's nothing you can do to stop this. Whatever whatever crimes would have been alleged or or brought forth is passed. In some states, certain crimes, there is no statute of limitations. In some states, you can't gra grandfather something that happened 20 years ago when the statute of limitations uh, that did run out have, have now passed. And so legally, there's something that can happen. You can't do anything legally. But does that mean that we should look at it in that regard? Because again, we're talking about our culture and how we look at things. A thousand years ago, this might not have been a problem. A thousand years ago, someone said, someone may have said that, hey, Mary was about the same age that she was and Joseph was that age. Yeah, but, but two things. One, uh, he was married already. Two, uh, you couldn't do what he did to an unmarried woman. You, you would still be in trouble. So our culture dictates that there's a huge age gap. One, she is a uh, an underage child. He's an adult male. And again, married. And he's betraying the trust of not just the Lord, but also this family. What the father was doing, how the father let it go. I don't know. Me personally, it, I, I would have just lost my top. I would I would have been totally different than, than that father. Um, there would have been some things, there would have been some, some laying on of hands, so to speak. And I think any father would agree with that. But yeah, me too. As a matter of fact, any mother, as a matter of fact, most men who are unrelated, who saw this would have a huge problem with that. So 
I don't know what the steps were. We are talking 1982. Sometimes what we did back then um, makes us scratch our head. Wait, is that how we used to do things? We do things different, a lot differently now. Some things for better, some things for worse. The way we treat sexual abuse then was definitely worse than how we do it now. Now we are more mindful of it as well as we should be. But back then, we did not treat it with the severity that it deserved. So now it's past. It's happened. He starts a church. The church, by all outside metrics, is a um, successful church. Now, doctrinally, I disagree. But we're talking a large church that has influence. What do you do? Do you set him down? Does does he need to be set down again? Is he now disqualified? Well, a couple of things. Going back to this Ani, that verb that's used to be, is he above reproach right now? Do the outsiders, do the insiders look down upon him right now? And here's a bigger issue. Does that cause a problem with us looking at the name of God, specifically the outsiders? How will they view that? Will they? Will that be an issue? Will they um, be upset? Will it bother? Will it upset the people? And or will it cause them to despise the Lord's offering? Not like it was in the, in the old covenant, but in terms of the church service, in terms of the Lord, the reading of His Word, because this is a man of God that represents that, and He's there. Does that have a problem? And it might. The issue with that church is that does this become a stumbling block for the people? The outsiders and the insiders, because you want the outsiders to eventually to place their faith in Christ. Are they going to look at this man and then that be uh, an impediment for them to do so because they can't get past looking at this person with these allegations? This might be an issue where you have repented of your sins, you've been placed in ministry, you have developed something, but now you have to step away for the benefit of the ministry, for the sake of the name of the Lord, so that his name will not be defiled or profane because of what you did and the consequences. We don't get to control the consequences. And so it might be that, you know what, you are forfeited forever. Now, the other point is for us, there's going to also be a knee jerk reaction that he's got to go. Um, in other words, and which is fine, but we don't want to be the ones that are out for our out for a pound of flesh either. So make sure that you view this in regards uh, to the scriptures as godly as possible. As Paul says in Galatians 6, considering yourself as well, this is one of those situations where, yeah, you know what? I think it might be best that you do step back because it's going to be hard. Now, how, how are you going to look at Robert Morris going forward and not think of this? If, if this were more known, more details, possibly, but even still, even still, no matter what you had known, there are just some things that you can't get past or some things that it's going to be rightly or wrongly, someone can say, but it's going to be hard to get past this issue. How do you ever look at Robert Morris, whether you're a believer or non-believer, and not have this issue in the back of your head? How does it not? It's like sitting in church service with someone who who, who you can't stand and can't stand you. Uh, it's hard to focus on what's happening, the word of God, because you're so focused on this other thing. This thing is an issue. And so I think it needs to be dealt with. Now for us, be careful, guys, that we don't determine what the consequences are. For me personally, I think he should be removed. I think for the good of the ministry, he should step back. I think he should do something else for the good of the ministry, for the sake of Christ, if it's bigger than him, which he would say. And so that's one of those things that you just have to let go. Will they? I don't know. If they don't, here's what I will not do. What I will not do if they don't sit him down. I'm not going to be one of the ones out protesting and say he's got to go. Uh, I pray that in spite of this, that the Lord gets glory. I pray in, in spite of this, that people come to Christ. Uh, my preference is that he should be set down. What we don't want to do is we don't want to be the ones, especially if we don't have a place to, to determine what the consequences are. Let those that are in charge, let them deal with that. Obviously, God is going to have the final say so uh, again. I think so. And I'm pretty sure most of you are probably going to land on the same side, even though it was 35 years ago. I think you need to sit down, not because you're necessarily involved in that sin. I pray that he's not. I'll take him at his word and everyone else's word that he's not. But this just it, it creates an ugly stain. And as I said before, two people can commit the exact same sin. Two can commit the exact same sin. And one might be restored to a particular ministry, whereas the other one cannot. 
it, it there are a lot of different factors in there, but this 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 one about being above reproach, about the outsiders looking at you, how people see you, uh, respectable. That part is difficult. Yeah, how, how do you how do you get past about being respectable? How do you, the above reproach, um, respectable? How do you get past the respectable part? Now I agree. I think that his issue of able to teach, I think that's an issue. I think that's an issue. But fine. If someone if someone wants to say, yeah, I think he can teach well, then fine. That's fine. I've never stated that he should step down because of his his doctrinal issues. But this is one that yeah. This is one of those ones, it's different. It's kind of unique because oftentimes when we see something like this, it's a recent sin. It's a current sin. Not one where the person has, by all accounts, repented of and has changed. This is different. And so I just pray that the Lord will have um, his way in this and that he gets glory. Now, he's going to get glory either in spite of us or through us. I pray that he gets glory in spite of this, in spite of this horrible situation. I pray that this young lady also grows in this, that she has, I don't know what her walk with in uh, with Christ is. Um, I don't know how much that hurts her. That's something else we need to think about. But I pray that in spite of all of this, that God gets glory. And through all of this, through the people involved, God gets glory as well. Amen.